Good afternoon and welcome to our TV show featuring documentaries revealing the realities behind myths using research and scholarship. I'm your host Ergun Kurlukovalı and I will be with you every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to send me your feedback at mythsandrealities.com. In episode 43, we have learned that Professor Justin McCarthy had discovered in the U.S. National Archives in 1990 a survey of Eastern Anatolia conducted in the summer of 1919 by two Americans, Captain Emery H. Niles and Mr. Arthur E. Sutherland, Jr. Their account is one of the first descriptions of the region by outside observers after World War I. However, the document was missing the author's field notes, which the authors emphasized should be read in conjunction with their report. McCarthy's paper placed the author's report in historical context. It also speculated why the results of their investigation were ignored and eventually forgotten. Some 20 years after that revelation, Niles and Sutherland's field notes have been found in the archives of the former American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. It's called ABCFM for short, in Istanbul, by another American historian, Brian Johnson, who has a PhD degree in Middle East history from the University of Washington. Today, in this episode 44, I will cover Johnson's research work titled Americans Investigating Anatolia, the 1919 Field Notes of Emery Niles and Arthur Sutherland, peer-reviewed and published in the Journal of Turkish Studies 34 to 2010. A PDF version is available on the internet. Quoting from this work, At the 1990 History Symposium held in Ankara, Turkey, Professor Justin McCarthy revealed the existence of a report by two Americans about the situation in eastern Anatolia following World War I. Between 14 July and 12 August 1919, Niles and Sutherland, who were in the service of the aid organization, the American Committee for Relief in the Near East, or Near East Relief for short, traveled from Mardin to Trabzon by way of Bitlis, Van, and Erzurum to determine local relief needs and how the Near East Relief could fill them. Apparently, they were the first Americans to enter this area of Turkey after the war. McCarthy discovered the Niles and Sutherland report in the U.S. National Archives mixed in among various papers related to the Harvard Commission, a survey expedition sent by the U.S. government to Anatolia and the South Caucasus in September 1919 to investigate the possibilities for an American mandate over the region and the establishment of an Armenian state that would encompass parts of eastern Turkey. Led by Major General James G. Harvard and composed primarily of U.S. military military officers, the group traveled from Mardin to Tiflis in the same general area that Niles and Sutherland had traversed a few weeks earlier, but by an alternate route over largely different territory. McCarthy included a transcript of the Niles and Sutherland report in his published paper, from the Ankara Symposium. He also underscored that the account was incomplete and missing critical segments, as evidenced by Niles and Sutherland's caveat. Quote, the object of this report is to summarize our observations as recorded in notes made at the time. This report should be taken in conjunction with these notes and not separately, unquote. McCarthy surmised that if the missing information were found, it would certainly enhance our historical understanding of the period. The field notes of the Niles and Sutherland have not been destroyed, nor are they lost. Two typewritten copies exist in the archives of the former American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, or ABCFM, in Istanbul. 
The notes will not now permit scholars to review and analyze the Niles and Sutherland report in the form intended by its authors. The existence of Niles and Sutherland's field notes in the archives of the ABCFM in Istanbul and the inclusion of their report in the papers of the Harvard Commission is part of a complex story that involves American Protestant missionary activity in the late Ottoman Empire. The destruction of the populations in Anatolia during and after the First World War and American humanitarian and political undertakings immediately after the conflict. The ABCFM was a protest, Protestant mission uh, uh, founded in 1810 and with the primary aim of propagating the gospel and spreading Protestant teachings worldwide. ABCFM missionaries first arrived in Anatolia in 1820, intending to introduce their beliefs to all the region's communities. Finding access to Muslims prohibited, they focused on Christians of the Eastern churches. By the second half of the century, the ABCFM had broadened its mission to include extensive ventures in general education and medical care. On the eve of the World War I, the board's 174 missionaries in Turkey were operating three theological schools, eight colleges, 46 secondary schools, and 369 other schools, in addition to 19 hospitals and dispensaries." Unquote. As a side note, Robert College of Istanbul, for example, is one of the most recognized schools founded in 1863 by missionaries, and for 40 years, it has accepted only Christians, mostly Armenians. The first Muslim student, a Turk, was accepted in 1903. I am an RC alumnus myself, the class of 1970. There was no religious teachings at RC since the establishment of the Republic of Turkey in 1923. Going back to Johnson's paper, I quote, the ABCFM properties in Turkey were valued in the millions of dollars. The outbreak of the First World War caught this missionary enterprise at full tide. Although the United States refrained from entering the conflict for almost three years, American missionaries in the Ottoman Empire could not carry on as before. Communications, travel, shipping, and other vital operations were impeded." Unquote. To make matters worse, the Armenians who deserted from the Ottoman army instigated rebellion in eastern Anatolia and fought alongside invading Russian forces on the Caucasian front. You can read on page 34 of the Macmillan Dictionary of the First World War by Pope and Will, London, 1997. Quote, Armenian nationalist movement had blossomed since the turn of the 20th century, armed and encouraged by the Russians, and several minor coups were repressed by the young Turk government before 1914 denied the right to a national congress in October 1914, moderate Armenian politicians fled to Bulgaria, but extreme nationalists crossed the border to form a rebel division with the Russian equipment. It invaded in December and slaughtered an estimated 120,000 uh, Muslims. And uh, Armenian insurgents killed another 80,000 Muslims during the Van Rebellion in April-May of 1915, ethnically cleansing the entire area Muslims. The two numbers add up to 200,000 Muslim dead, representing about 2% of the entire Ottoman Empire's Muslims. What would America do if an armed and murderous domestic insurgent group took up arms against America and killed 2% of Americans or 6.6 .6 million citizens? Would America stop at temporary, temporarily resettling the insurgents and their logistic bases like the Ottomans did in 1915? Or would a Waco or a Nagasaki be on the table? 
consider that the U.S. waged a global war because 3,000 3, Americans were killed on 9-11. Uh, according to researchers at Brown University, the U.S. spent $5.8 trillion in Afghanistan and other conflicts stemming from 9-11, killing more than 1 million Muslims, mostly non-combatant civilians. Food for thought. Going back to Johnson's paper, I quote, the measures undertaken by the Ottoman government in the spring of 1915 to expel Armenians from the war zones and elsewhere in its territory, as well as military hostilities, intercommunal strife, and indiscriminate violence and banditry led to exile, flight, or death of a great number of Anatolia's Armenian inhabitants during the war. Some ABCFM personnel who remained in Turkey opened their institutions to those who were displaced or orphaned. But when the United States finally joined the Allies in 1917 and diplomatic relations with the Ottoman Empire were broken, many American board personnel left the region and a number of board facilities closed. By 1915, members of the ABCFM and prominent individuals in the U.S. business and political establishment had created an agency, the American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief. ACASR, to assist what they saw as the defenseless, suffering Christian, mainly Armenian populations of Anatolia and surrounding areas. Cleveland Dodge, a wealthy industrialist, philanthropist, and close friend of President Woodrow Wilson, was one of the principal founders. The ABCFM's corresponding secretary, James L. Barton, served as its chairman and American board commissioner, missionaries, supporters, and affiliates comprised much of its membership. During the 19th century, ABCFM missionaries who lived in Anatolia, spoke its languages, and experienced its cultures had served as a major source of information for Americans about the Ottoman Empire and its internal happenings. The missionaries generally sympathized with the Armenians and other Christians in whose communities they had invested so heavily. Likewise, they tended to view the Muslim populace as lesser, misguided, and oppressive. Missionary publications and their reports to the U.S. and internal, international press cultivated pro-Christian, pro-Armenian sentiment and aroused anti-Muslim, anti-Turk prejudices. During World War I, American missionaries continued to be uh, principal informants about events in Anatolia. Even today, their accounts remain a prime source for the history of this era and are often accepted without critique. Promotional literature and other material, including films generated by ACASR and its successor, Nearest Relief, after August 1919, displayed a similar tone. Muslims, especially Turks, were denigrated, and Armenians and other Christians idealized. The latter were presented as the sole sufferers during the, and after the war, persecuted ruthlessly and relentlessly by the former. This skewed publicity was effective in raising money for the relief agency in the United States from 1915 to 1920. Over $40 million were collected. It, one historian has described the organization's public relations drive as propaganda in the service of a good cause. But as a pr prominent scholar of American philanthropy in the Middle East has stressed, while such publicity helped to raise money, it did not contribute to an understanding of the problems of the area. It exploited the religious differences between the Turks and Armenians without disclosing that during much of the 19th century, the Christian subjects of, the, of Turkey had enjoyed a degree of religious freedom that was not accorded to dissenters from the established faith in some of the more enlightened kingdoms of Europe. It overlooked the existence of an active Armenian revolutionary party and left unmentioned 
the doubts entertained by the Ottoman government as to the loyalty of the Armenians. It failed to point out that many of the Armenians had lived in a theater of war or that Muslim Turks were also suffering, unquote. During the war, ACASR helped dwindled, but after armistice on October 30th, 1918, the organization, now near its relief, mobilized to ship food, clothing, medicines, and other items to Anatolia under the leadership of its chairman, James Barton. The relief providers needed information about material needs and logistical conditions to accomplish their aims, which included repatriating displaced Armenians and restoring their former communities within the borders of an imagined independent state. This would also enable ABCFM to re resume its work interrupted by the war. Let's read, quote, from March to May 1919, Barton personally directed a survey expedition from Istanbul through central and eastern Turkey to Aleppo and back. In a letter describing the trip to Admiral Bar Mark Bristol, senior U.S. naval commander and soon to be U.S. High Commissioner in Turkey, Barton urged occupying all of Anatolia with a military force. He claimed it was essential to protect the Armenians from the Turks and allow them to recover to a level of self-support. Furthermore, he also stressed that without direct intervention, there's a great danger that the atrocities of four years ago may be reenacted in an exaggerated form." Unquote. Major Davis G. Arnold, a U.S. military officer who took over Barton's work at the nearest relief, gave Niles and Sutherland their orders from the headquarters on June 25th to survey the area of eastern Anatolia that Barton did not visit. On 3rd of July, they left Derinje via rail, past Konya in Aleppo, and arrived in Mardin on 11th of July. They commenced the journey on 14th. Over the next 30 days, they visited 23 cities in a rocky, war-ravaged territory. They traveled by train, horse, carriage, and automobile as the local conditions allowed. The mission ended on August 12th at the Black Sea port of Trabzon. They returned to Istanbul on 15th of August, completed their nearest relief uh, service, and they left Turkey within a few days. Let's continue reading. Quote, Prior to leaving for home, they typed up their field notes and drafted a final report of their journey. The rough, unpolished nature of the two manuscripts, as well as the author's proviso that they should be read together, suggests that both documents were prepared hurriedly before Niles and Sutherland sailed for the United States. Undoubtedly, their field notes and report were available to administrators of nearest relief in Turkey. This explains how the notes emerged from the American Board Archives in Istanbul. From the files of nearest relief committee member and ABCFM business agent and treasurer William Pete. It also hints at how their report might have found its way into the papers of the Harvard Commission. Earlier in, in summer, President Wilson had appointed Major General James G. Harvard of the U.S. Army to lead an expedition to Anatolia and Transcaucasia. He was ordered to investigate American political, military, and economic interests and obligations in the region, particularly regarding Armenian security, repatriation, and requirements for establishing a state. The mission had been planned in consideration of a political and military takeover of this territory by a major power, especially the United States, as a mandate of the Paris Peace Conference then in progress. Vigorous lobbying by, Jane, by James Barton and like-minded supporters of such a protectorate encouraged the Wilson administration to organize the Harvard Commission. 
Harbert was advised to solicit information from a number of individuals during his journey, including American missionaries residing in Anatolia and the Caucasus. After disembarking at Istanbul on September 2nd, he spent several days meeting with local U.S. officials, missionaries, and relief workers. James Barton, who was preparing to return to the U.S., helped him plan the itinerary for his mission. Harbert probably received a copy of the Niles and Sutherland report at this time from someone affiliated with the nearest relief, most likely as a background material about the area that he was going to investigate. On September 7th, he set out for the same general region from which Niles and Sutherland had just returned. Niles and Sutherland's field notes consists of 34 typewritten pages, which is considerably longer than the 20, 21 pages of their report. The notes are grouped into four sections or books which may correspond to actual notebooks carried by the travelers. The consistent style of the text seems to indicate that it is the work of one compiler, Emery Niles. Emery Niles, the senior of the two, might have fulfilled this role. He had served in executive post at the supply depot at Derinje, and his experience in the logistics of relief a relief work would have qualified him well for the task. His practical knowledge was probably a major reason why he had been chosen for the survey expedition. Niles and Sutherland carried out their investigation methodically. They wanted to guide planners of relief efforts and their reporting was systematic and dispassionate as in a logistics document. Covering an average of 65 kilometers per day, they considered geography, agriculture, food availability, and the transportation infrastructure. They recorded war damage, including demographic and material losses. They also interviewed local officials and inhabitants and weighed the informant's comments against their own observations. After evaluating this information, they made projections about the need for food supplies and other support. Several villages passed, about half of which destroyed completely. Other half had a few inhabitants who seemed in fairly miserable condition. Roads, very poor, being crossed at many points by streams which made body stretches. Each bridge had several widths of flooring missing. Road in present condition, not practicable for autos. Niles and Sutherland's analysis of the countryside shows their uncertainty about the productivity of the land. After walking through the village, they realize that the folks here may starve to death if help doesn't arrive and they suggest a large-scale food relief covering many cities. They also describe war damages and population loss in eastern Anatolia by comparing before and after war figures. World War I had taken a heavy toll on all the peoples of eastern Anatolia. Between 1915 and 1918, the Russians and Armenians occupied Van, Erzurum, Bitlis, and Trabzon. After the Russian Revolution in 1917, the Russian army left, leaving Armenian forces in place, which is when Armenian atrocities victimizing defenseless Muslims peaked. When the Ottomans launched a counteroffensive in early 1918, the Armenians fled eastward, while Muslims of, Muslims of the, uh, Muslim Armenia moved westward in the Ottoman territory. Niles and Sutherland encountered many such Muslim refugees, especially Kurds. Their data reveal the much ignored destruction of Eastern Turkish communities, especially Muslims, during the war. Next week, in episode 45, we will learn and analyze Dr. Brian Johnson's conclusions. Thank you for joining me 
and see you next week.